Dennis Conroy. Uh, he works uh, for Wycliffe Bible Translators. And uh, so come on up. And last time he was here was uh, just after I arrived, so about three years ago, and his whole family was able to come. Uh, but regrettably, his wife and children are not able to be with him today. Uh, but we welcome you and are excited to have you with us this morning and uh, give us a, a little uh, overview of all that's going on uh, in the world of uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators. And we do thank you as well for the wonderful gift that you sent us uh, last year, I believe it was, of the uh, translation of the Dury oh, yes. uh, New Testament. So we're very grateful for that, and it's very important work. So let's uh, bow our heads and open with a word of prayer, and then we will go ahead and, and allow Dennis the floor. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we can partner with missionaries around the world to see the spread of the gospel into communities uh, that are filled with darkness and have no even glimmer of light for all that we can see. We thank you, too, for the work of Wycliffe Bible translators as they uh, seek to give uh, people the scriptures in their own heart languages. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would open our hearts uh, to this great need of mission work and open our eyes to how, uh, and our ears to how we can better support and pray for Dennis and his family and uh, the work that they are doing. Uh, again, Lord, we thank you for your grace, uh, which has uh, prompted us, caused us to be concerned with lost souls. And we ask, O oh Lord, that this burden would only grow and that we would be able to be more fervent in our work as well as our prayers uh, for these sorts of things. And we ask that you would bless uh, us in this time together, and we pray that you would bless Dennis in his work as well as his presentation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Let's see, testing. Yep, we're live. Good morning. A lot of technology here to work on. Um, sound people and projection people. And then there's me. Um, it's good. It was good. It's good to be here. It's good to be back at Lock Raven. Uh, as Pastor was saying, I was here about three years ago, I think. And I had more of my family with me, but uh, they couldn't come. So they send their greetings from Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. Go ahead. And, is it started? There we go. Okay, this is this is my family. Uh, there we go. James. Uh, we have four children: three girls and a boy. Um, Elizabeth is our. Well, I'll start from left to right. Elizabeth is my uh, third child. She's uh, doing a summer internship in Mexico right now. Hannah is our oldest. Daniel. Um, my son is graduated from college, is now wor a working man in the Chicago area. Abigail's our youngest. She's a, a, she'll be a sophomore at Covenant College next year. And then my wife, Rhonda. So we've been with Mission of the World since 1987 and with Wycliffe Bible Translators since 1990. So we've been at this for a while. Uh, point. There we go. These are some things I hope to talk about this morning. Where we live, where we work, and what we do. Uh, why bother with a Bible translation? That's a good question. Why, why do we exist? And then I want to talk about technology and the use of technology in Bible translation. Uh, what's left to do? Uh, we're getting close to seeing the end of the goal, end, the end, end of the the finish line, that's what I'm trying to say. When I joined Wycliffe, we couldn't see the finish line, but now it's, it's in view. And there we go, the finish line. And then some opportunities. When my wife Rhonda and I started uh, in 1990 with Wycliffe, it was hard to tell where the finish line was because the, the number kept growing. They kept finding more languages and more languages that needed translation. And so it was overwhelming and the number kept changing. So the goal line kept moving. but 
that, that was up to like around 2000, the year 2000. And then something amazing happened. As the number of unreached languages reached 3000, it began to drop just after the year 2000. It was amazing. It was the first time in history that we had more projects in progress started than we had left to do. It had always been the other way around. We had so much more to do than what we had already started. We currently have 2,200 20, projects in progress right now from the start, somewhere in the process, 2,200. And um, only 1,900 left to go. So it, it's possible that this generation will see the, the task completed. And that's, that's pretty exciting for me. And I hope you get excited about it too. In the, um, let's get, move on. Okay. Oh, yeah, where we, where we live. Okay, this is approximately where we, we are here now, the United States. And the small square is where I live in the Philippines. We lived there, my wife and I and family lived there for 20 years. We moved in 1994. And the area, the big box, is Southeast Asia. That's my, kind of my territory. That's my area of, of translation help. We used to be, previous visits, my focus was Indonesia. I don't know if you remember, some of you remember that. Indonesia was our focus, but it's now expanded to all of Southeast Asia. So I like to say I have good job security. There's a, my, my, my work is expanded. Yeah, here's a small, uh, little closer up. And then the city of Davao in the red circles. Let's see, there's a, well, we'll forget the pointer. The city, let's see where we live is in the red circle there, in the southern part of the Philippines. Uh, I turned it off. Did I turn it off? Is there an on-off switch? I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there a switch on there? I don't know. I pushed something there. Oh, it. Okay, thank you. Uh, where are we here? Okay. So this is what I want, to, oops, I want to talk about what I do with Wycliffe. I'm not a Bible translator. I work for Bible translators. But my job is print, to get Bibles printed. So I, get, I take the manuscripts from these translators and get it in print. I do customized Bible maps. You know, those colorful maps in the back of your Bibles. I, I do those. We have black and white and color maps. And I'll talk a little bit later about expanding beyond print. We're now into electronic publishing in a big way. Some more Bibles. My wife is a teacher, a uh, high school biology teacher, and she's done a number of, she's taught a number of times at the, our missionary kids school in Davao, Philippines. It's an opportunity for her to serve in that way in teaching. It's our kids, this is where our kids went to school for 12 years, for most of 12 years, and so it's a really good, a good school environment for them. The school provides uh, support for many missions in the southern Philippines. They can send their kids to school here, and then they can do ministry. And uh, it's, it's a, a great community. I have a short video here, a clip that will say, why bother with tr translation? Let's see if, if it'll start. Okay, we might have to manually click on the screen. It worked in rehearsal. Oops. Okay. Try the lower left corner of the black screen. Maybe there's a start button there or something hidden right down there somewhere. I don't know. Well, 
Well, I may have to talk instead. Yeah, I guess I'm going to have to talk. Um, I, I, that's the next slide, but we'll just go with that. Um, so why Bible translation? Why bother? Uh, let's see if I can summarize what the video is going to tell me, tell us. Um, it's important to communicate God's word as accurately as we can. And leaving it in a, in a language that's not your own is not the best form of having God's word. It's like having you suddenly have to do Greek and Hebrew. Um, some of you may know Greek and Hebrew, a few of you might, but most of us don't know the original languages. Yeah, there's a few people here that should know it, right? <laughs> but that's, that's the situation for most of, uh, uh, well, at least 2,000 or 1,900, well, most of the world actually, they need a translation because they don't know the original languages. We don't have, uh, we're not using Greek and Hebrew in our churches, we're using English. So we want God's word for all God's people. So why shouldn't we translate it into all the languages of the world, no matter how small? So I could do, there's many examples of why Bible translation, but I'll just leave it at it's important. Well, the Westminster Confession, our standard of faith here in the PCA, speaks of that in the first chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith. I don't have it in front of me, but it basically says wherever the gospel goes, as we bring the gospel to a new, a new area, we bring the translated word with it, with it, or before or after, but we need to bring the translated word to those people so they can hear God's word speak to their heart. This is a, shows some of the language needs that are still left. This count says 1859, so it's even under 1900. Most of, the, most of the language needs are in Africa and Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia Pacific area. So that's why I told you I have job security. There's still, what, a thousand languages there in the Paci Asian Pacific? And that's kind of the area that I, I work in. So I could work in the whole world, but I, I need to concentrate somewhere. So um, I've got a good, good area of concentration. Africa, there's a couple countries in Africa where there's a, a, a bunch of languages, a bunch of small tribes that ha need translation. And even still in the Americas, where we've been, Wycliffe's been there for 60 or 80 years, we still have languages still to do. In, um, oh, this way. in 1999, Wycliffe members were looking at the, s the progress and how far we had left to go. And they believed that God gave them a vision, a, a task, and they called it Vision 2025, to see a Bible translation program in progress in every language that still needs one by the year 2025. Now, humanly speaking, that was an impossible task to say that we're going to do everything by this particular goal. At the rate we were going in 1999, it would have been the year 2150 before we would finish, or possibly finish. 150 years. And I guess that wasn't real exciting to, to us to think we've got to keep plodding along, plodding along for 150, people are going to, generations will live and die in that 150 years. So we thought, why don't we give ourselves a kick in the pants and see if we can start this in, in, by 2025. And what that's done, it's given us a renewed sense of urgency, uh, uh, energy, it's changed the organization quite a bit. We've partnered with other organizations around the world. We've decided to do cluster uh, translations. Instead of one translator going to one tribe and translating one New Testament or Bible, many times now we have one translator going into an area and he's got between six and 10 neighboring languages and he pulls them together and he's the facilitator trainer and he has 10 or six to 10 translators, native translators, sitting around at a table with their laptops translating 10 languages at the same time. So things like that of what's changed translation today. 
um, is, again, energized and changed us as an organization. We believe God's honored our commitment to this goal, and we've seen the fastest acceleration of Bible translation in the history of the world. It's possible right now the last translator of the last language is now somewhere in the world living. You know, maybe he's a baby, but he's alive. So that's exciting. And uh, I'm excited to, to see that come. Like I said, it was a long, it was a huge goal when I joined, and now we, we might see the end of the Bible translation task. Let's see here. Another video, which we'll probably skip. Anybody remember these things? <laughs> yeah, well, you're dating yourself if you remember using encyclopedias in print. I used to love as a kid grabbing the encyclopedia off the shelf. I was, instead of reading books and novels, I was reading encyclopedias. You know, kind of strange, but uh, anyway, now. who uses, who uses tra now? Nobody. Oh, somebody does, okay. <laughs> Most of us don't. What do we do? Wikipedia, Google it. I mean, I just, it's right there. I don't know the answer. Google it. Just type in the question, find an answer. It's quick and it's usually up to date. So technology has, has radically changed the world. It has changed missions and Bible translation. Um, I forget somebody, somebody famous, somebody that started a mission agency a number of years ago was quoted as saying the airplane was invented for finishing the missionary task. And people kind of laughed and snickered. Well, yeah, it wasn't invented for that purpose. Well, you could almost say the cell phone was invented for Bible translation because this is now the, the most popular media medium for getting the God, God's word out to people. Um, you don't have to have a real expensive smartphone. Just, just a basic phone that you can put memory chips into or something, and you can have the Bible text on your phone, you can have uh, the Jesus film, maybe clips of it on your phone. And so it's a, it's a wonderful way to get the word out to people who don't have access to a print Bible. Because when these are printed and distributed in a, in a particular language area, they are sit in boxes. They sit in storage. And suppose you're a young man, you've gone, you've had the opportunity to go to university in the big city the capital, or even further away. You've gone to London or something for your university training. Well, you're, the Bible now has been translated into your language and it's sitting in boxes in your home church. And you're in London. So what do you do? You get your handy cell phone out and you download a Bible app called Uversion, or it's called Bible, I think it's called Bible app, and look at over a thousand different language choices. There's at least a thousand or more I think I've got a couple of clips of that. But I think it's exciting that we have this technology. Let's see. Again, just some pictures of our options we have today. This is quite outdated now. Some of you young people know that some of these things are already old hat and you moved on to other things, but I'm still, in, I'm still trying to catch up with these things. Um, I have an example of one use of technology today that's helped the Bible translation task is, is with the Yawa language, Yawa people of Papua New Guinea. Imagine boarding a plane in Baltimore and heading south to Southeast Asia to visit the Yawa people. You will travel for several days by plane, then board a truck and journey into the lush green mountains on a deeply rutted, muddy road. If the recent rains have caused landslides to cover the road, you may need to continue on foot. Eventually, you'll come to a small village nestled in the mountain valley where the local language people speak. The language they speak is Yawa. In the past, the people in this village worshipped the official in the official language of the country, Indonesian, not the language of their home and heart. But things have changed dramatically since the arrival of the scriptures in the Yawa language. The availability of Bible portions and now the complete New Testament has a huge impact on the way the Yahweh people worship and their understanding of the message of the gospel. If you ask if anyone preaches from Yahweh, you'll hear things like Elder Sefnet 
does all the time. When you find him, he might show you two small worn out books protected by brown paper. Translations of John's writings, early, early portions of the scriptures that he had. He treasures these, He's, he treasured them even now, even now he has the complete New Testament, he still treasures those portions. Tucked into the pages are slips of paper with dated sermons, references to scripture passages in those two little books. Continue your walk through the village, you might stop by a, a certain thatch roof home and ask if anyone there reads from the scriptures. I mean, why translate if no one's going to read them? The residents will, will point to a bearded old man and say, Grandfather Bertasar, he reads to us. He read to us this morning. He told us how to apply it to our lives. You continue on, you'll come to the village church. If you had visited there, in 2009 or 2010, you would have encountered an amazing scene. In, the, in this very remote village, where there is still neither electricity nor phone service, the translator Mandawan spent his days at a laptop computer. Think about that for a minute. There's no electricity and there's no phone service. A dozen people often clustered closely around him, listening as he read a Bible portion in the Awa out loud. The volunteer reviewers would enthusiastically discuss it, looking for ways to improve awkward or unclear sentences. When they were satisfied with the way it sounded, the translator, Mandawan, would revise it on his computer. Then he would log on to the internet, got that? He's logging onto the internet and using the send receive function of his specially designed software program. Then he so he syncs his draft with some cloud service, and then he continues on. Halfway around the world, in Arlington, Texas, Wycliffe translator Linda Jones would get up in the morning, turn on her computer, open up her program, and sync the text with the cloud, synchronizing with the text from the translator in Papua New Guinea. They've been doing this well, they've been doing remote translation for 17 years because her husband, Larry, was called to be into administrative roles, so they had to leave the village. And how would they continue to do this translation if he was in, in, they were not in the village? Before the internet connection, before having internet, scripture drafts went back and forth by mail and hand carry packets. Linda and Larry made trips to the village, and Mandawan made trips out of the village. Always God helped them find a way forward. But Larry and Linda thought they had reached the end of the road when it came to the final revision. So the, manu the New Testament is done, it's completed, but they need to revise it, and it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. We did not see how we could finish the final revisions of the New Testament without greater community involvement, said Linda. It just looked impossible. I could not go there for any length of time, and they could not come here. So, in 2009, a new geostationary satellite started circling the equator. Just so happened. Wycliffe IT specialists were ready. Just two weeks after the satellite was, went into service, they carried a computer and a small satellite device to the village. So do I have a picture? Oh, no. Oh, these are just another fun pictures. There it is. This is a picture of the device. They went into the village. They taught several of the men how to use this satellite uh, connection and taught them some software programs to use. It was just in time with Manawan and the village reviewers working in Southeast Asia and Linda working in Texas. They finished the final revisions of the New Testament. Today, the Yahweh have their own published copies of the scriptures, which they now use to learn about God and grow in him. So again, technology, just in time when they, they needed it. So these men would sit around the table, working on the final draft, revising it, testing it. How's it sound? Does it sound okay, not okay? Make changes. They sync their computer up with the, the cloud. And Linda gets up the next morning, 12, 13 hours difference in time zones, 
and then she would check the revisions, make sure they're, they're, they're accurate and they, they conform to the scripture, the, the original languages. She would send notes back to him and they would just go back and forth. It took months to do that. And then a typesetter, I, not my story, but the, a typesetter, a colleague of mine, was in Waxhaw, North Carolina, doing the same sort of thing, drafting it, sending copies to the, the team in Papua, and back and forth they would go until they finally got it ready for printing. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's doable because of technology. Now, I want to go back here. This is uh, the Bible program I was talking about. This is a, it's called Uversion. I think it, that's official name, but I think on your, on your phone it might just call Bible app. Over a thousand. At the top there it says the book, John, I don't know if you can see it, and then the next to it it says NLT. So you choose your English version you prefer and you can have the, the Bible, your Bible on your phone or your tablet or computer. But these are copies that I clipped off of my phone. I don't know what language these are in, but they're, in not, they're not English, if you can tell. Especially the one on the right is, a, is an Asian script. So it's amazing that people all over the world can now get the scriptures in their own language, at least in a thousand different languages, and it's, it's rapidly changing, increasing. Okay. So in an age of increasing uncertainty and change, rapid change, I mean, we've all seen a lot of change and it just seems to go faster. How will these people be reached around the world that still haven't heard the gospel? We can train more people, train nationals, and we are, Wycliffe is involving many more nationals in translation. We can't do it by ourselves, so let's not do it by ourselves. Let's get other people involved. And in churches, we're getting more and more churches involved. It used to be the in the old days at Wycliffe, you would go in and you would do your translation no matter what the people thought. Uh, they need the word, so you just did it. And if the church didn't like it, the mayor didn't like it, the people were against you, you just plugged along and did it. But it doesn't, then the word isn't accepted. We need, we need the word to be accepted as it's translated. So we involve the national churches. And then materials were developed. We need to develop more translation helps for national translators and more, more books in general. Most of these people are illiter illiterate. They're oral cultures. They learn by listening and hearing stories, not by reading a book. So we can help them. So, let me back up here. Back up, here we go. How much, I talked about the accuracy of scripture. Oh, by the way, someone tell me if I'm going over or not. Give me the high sign or the something. Words matter in translation. Uh, one example that I personally am aware of, because I, it, was a, it was a New Testament that I was working on back in the early 90s, um, a translator named Andrew came to me. We were f doing the final publishing of his New Testament. He had had the manuscript to me, and I was doing some checks on it to make sure everything was there. People say, well, what are you checking for? Well, one thing you're checking for, is it all there? I mean, there are files, and in, in previous days, every book of the New Testament was in a separate file on your computer. And so you might have deleted one accidentally. You may, when you copied it to your disk, you didn't copy all of them. So I check it. Is it all there? And um, I check a lot of other things, too. But this day, Andrew came to me and said, we got a big problem. We had just done the first draft of Romans. I'd, I'd done a printout so he could look at it and read through it one last time. And as he was reading Romans, I think it was somewhere in chapter 5, he said the, 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 a word had gotten turned around or two, two consonants or um, vowels had gotten transposed. And it said, Jesus has come to kill us. That was the message of Romans 5. So he said, that's pretty serious. We need to change that real quick. Jesus didn't come to, to kill. So two, two letters changed it from kill to save. I mean, from save to kill. So we, we caught that, fortunately. And um, so anyway, words matter. Um, I like this example from, from Cameroon. Um, it's been told and told, and I like how it talks about the importance of words. Translator Lee Bramlett 
who worked for the uh, HDI. How do you spell HDI, ain't they? HDI. The Hitty people. I'll just call them the Hitty people of northern Cameroon. Lee was confident that God had left his mark on the Hitty culture somewhere. There's, there's this thing called a, a redemptive analogy. Somewhere in the culture, there's some way that the gospel connects with that, with that culture. And he, was, just, he hadn't found it yet, and he wasn't searching for it, hoping that God would show him that connection. One night, in a dream, God prompted Lee to look again at the Hitty word for love. Lee and his wife, Tammy, had learned the verbs in Hitty consistently end in one of three vowels. For almost every verb, they could find forms ending in I, A, and U. But when it came to the word love, they could only find I and A. Why was there no word for love ending in U? Lee asked the Hitty Translator Committee, Translation Committee, which included the most influential leaders of the community, could you, in the words DVI, could you DV your wife? Yes, they said. That would mean that the wife had been loved because, no, had been loved, but that love was gone. It was a past tense, loved in, in the past. Could you diva your wife? Yes, they said. That kind of love depends on the wife's actions. She would be loved as long as she remained faithful and cared for her husband. Could you divu, D-V-U, could you divu your wife? Everyone laughed. Of course not, they said. If you said that, you would have to keep on loving your wife no matter what she did. Even if she never got you, never got you water, never made you breakfast or meals, even if she committed adultery, you would be compelled to keep loving her. No, we would never say divu. That doesn't exist. Lee sat quietly for a while, thinking about John 3.16. And then he asked, could God devu people? And there was complete silence for three or four minutes. Then they started crying. These weathered old faces were crying. Finally, they responded, do you know what this would mean? This would mean that God kept on loving us over and over, thousands of years. Well, all the time, we rejected this great love. He is compelled to love us, even though we have sinned more than any people. One simple vow, and the meaning was changed from I love you based on what you do and who you are, to I love you based on who I am. I love you because of me, not because of you. God had encoded the story of his unconditional love right into the Hindi language. For centuries, that little word was there. It just needed to be discovered. Around the world, community by community, as God's word is translated, people are gaining access to this great love story about how God loves them and how he has devoted enough to sacrifice his unique son for us so that our relationship with him can be restored and oriented correctly. So words matter. One key word made a difference in this language. A short, another short one. You all know about what Jesus was, was laid in when he was born. He was laid in a manger. And we don't think much about it sometimes, but what was a manger? A manger was a feeding trough for animals or some sort of a container for food. So the idea is that he was humbly born and they had no place to put this baby but in a manger. In Nigeria, there's a language that they were working, translators were working with, and they came to this word, in that local language it looks like opang, and they were asking, tell me what this thing looks like. Describe it, opang. And he described it as essentially a cradle hung by ropes that the newborn can be laid in and swung. So this nice little cradle, you know, this, isn't that nice? You know, nice image, Jesus in a upang, or opang. Read the translation notes. They had some translation notes to help them understand um, this passage in Luke chapter 2. So they checked their translation notes. 
Um, and they said, what does this say about the manger? And the translators read the notes and saw that the manger referred to an animal feeding trough. And even as the team read the notes, they objected. We have always used the word opon. We have used it for years, and that's what we should use. So they were kind of stubborn, weren't they? This is what we've always done. It's tradition. So the translator pointed out to them that it wasn't just a matter of tradition. God expects us to find the words that express the original meaning as accurately as possible. Furthermore, this word tells us something, about, something profound about God. When he came to live among us and bring salvation to us, he came in the lowliest way possible. He did not come to sleep in a nice opan, like every other tribal mother wants her newborn. Instead, he showed us his unbelievable humility. John told them, so, this is the translator, so we need to find the best word for an animal feeding trough. Suddenly, the one who'd argued most loudly for the traditional term said, we feed our animals out of an old worn out basket that is not usable anymore, except to feed the animals. And he came up with a word for that basket. So it's an old basket to feed the horses or cows or whatever it is, but we can't use it anymore because it's now a feeding basket. Then try that term, John said. Put it in your rough draft and test it with native speakers, uh, people outside of our committee. As the people listened, they were visibly moved. Picturing the newborn baby living in the animal's feeding basket, they recognized in a new way that Jesus was willing to do whatever it took to reach them. As an adult, he would humble himself by washing the disciples' feet and then by dying on the cross. And this humility started right after birth, right from birth, when he was born to a young peasant woman under questionable social conditions and laid in an animal feeding trough. No word in scripture is too unimportant to translate carefully and accurately. And no language community is too unimportant to merit the scriptures in the language they best understand. Translation in the heart language respects the people who speak it. And through the process, it frees them to have a relationship with God in their own words and their own terms. So no word is too unimportant. We've already seen some information about, again, here's a repetition about the areas, the greatest areas of translation need in Southeast Asia, Pacific area, and then Central Africa. So we're reaching the finish line, or at least it's visible. It's, it's, it's on the horizon. But what does it look like to finish the task of Bible translation? At least in terms, I mean, not finish the task of reaching the, every tribe and people and language with the gospel. What about translation? What does it look like to finish the job? Cameron Townsend, who was the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators back in the 19, 1930s, when he first had his vision of creating access to scriptures for every unreached people group, he thought there might be 500 languages in the world. His goal was that the New Testament would be, for those 500, would be translated before he died. It's, someone said that one of the last things he said as he was dying was, I didn't get to see the finish. And he said, so finish, what finish? He said, I didn't get to see the last language translated. And he died in the 1980s. So he was way, we were way short of the goal in the 1980s, but now we think we're close. Today there are nearly 7,000 languages, half of which have the scriptures they need, which is still being defined. While it's still being defined, I believe our goal today might include oral stories, maybe the Jesus, Jesus film, New Testaments, and at least parts of the Old Testament. It would also include ensuring that people have the skills they need to engage with scriptures. They need to be able to read. They can't just have the scripture, they need to be able to read too. So the goal is zero, zero translation needs and zero unreached people groups. 
God has a plan to reach these people. Revelation tells us that there will be representatives in heaven from every tribe and people and language praising him at the throne of God. So become a partner. Be, get involved in Bible translation. Uh, you, can, uh, you can pray. Pray for us. Pray for Bible translations. Pick a project. Find, find a, a language that has not yet had a, a, a translation project and pray for that, that people. Um, and you can give. You can support with your finances. You can support in other ways. And you can go. There are, there are still people needed to go. Um, the world is, we're ri- missionaries are going, coming from all sorts of countries these days, but it doesn't, it doesn't absolve us from still going. We have the resources, we have people, and we have the command of Jesus, go into all the world. So some of you can go, whether you're a young 20-something looking for something to do, or even younger, or if you're middle, in the middle range of ages, and you're looking at maybe changing your career or thinking maybe life is just kind of boring, consider missions, consider going with uh, Bible translation. And I don't have time to tell you, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of jobs with Wycliffe, not just Bible translators. So if you don't think you're good with languages, I'm not. I speak English only. Um, But there's a place for you. There's a place for for you in, in Wycliffe. Yes, the finish line. The finish line is there. It's close. It's on the horizon. Let me conclude with... Among the parables in Luke 15 are the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. You're all familiar with those parables. Jesus is illustrating the heart of the Father and the extent to which he will go for one person. God extending his message of grace and love to the least, the last, and the lost. I want to offer you the opportunity to be part of this historic effort to reach the remaining people groups with the good news of the gospel. God may be asking you to pray, to give or to go, or to advocate for Bible translation. Be an advocate. Get excited about it and talk about it and recruit others. You can be a part of limiting Bible poverty and writing and injustice. You can be part of extending the news of, of God's grace to the, least, to the least, the last, and the lost. Jesus cared enough to die for them. They deserve to hear God's word. If you're interested, you could check out Wycliffe's uh, website, wycliffe.org. I've got cards here, information about my, my own family and ministry. Talk to me. Grab a card, sign up for our newsletters, our, our prayer updates. Um, and anyway, I'll be here till Tuesday morning. So I'll either grab me after church, after Sunday school, or sometime before Tuesday. And if there's time for questions or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if we could get the lights again, please. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes, sir. Have we found any cultures that have no written language? Most of the languages that we're working in now have no written language. There are very, there's only about 100 or 200 languages that have an alphabet. Uh, that's a guess. Most languages I, that I know of that we're, Wycliffe's working in have no, have no alphabet. No, no, there's nothing written. So the translator has to create an alphabet. He has to create a voca- uh, dictionary. He has, to cre- he has to create the language, I mean, with the help of the people, but they're oral cultures, so there's no, there's no, no alphabet. Yes, sir? Does that mean he has to know the language, teach their language, and then translate? More or less, that's true. He, oh, yeah. He said, do they have... Oh. Um, no, no, that's yeah, I'm, I'm trying... Does the, if they're going into a language that, ha, that has no written language, a people group, do they have to learn, does the translator have to learn the language, translate the language, oh, create the language? Well, he does, okay, it's not, it's an unwritten language, does he have to create it? Yes, he does. It's, but he's not starting from scratch. Let's say he's in Indonesia, I'm familiar with Indonesia. 
there is a national language and a national alphabet. Most times we will stick with the national alphabet and, and use those letters as a base. But yes, there's, this language isn't Indonesian that we're working on, we're translating. So the translator has to listen. He has to make notes about how this sounds and what's the best way of representing those sounds. So he's learning the language and after about maybe three or four years, he may know it enough that he can then start making rough translations of the Christmas story or something. So he tests that and says, okay, does this make sense and is it readable? So though now will be an, this language will now have an alphabet. It will now have text that he can now use to translate the scriptures. But it's a, it's a, it's a 15 to 25 year process. Mm -hmm. okay. It's all written the same, but somebody from Beijing can't understand what somebody from Shanghai or Hong Kong is saying, okay. but they can write to each other. Do you find that uh, common, where they, the written word is the same, but the dialect is so different you can't talk to them? The written word, as in this word, is the same in this, these two, all right. The question is whether different dialects using the same, same, wor written word. same written words, but don't understand each other. What, have we, have we come, in, come across that? I, I'm not sure, but I would guess, I would guess not. Um, I'd say the, the national alphabet, like I said, in Chinese, I would imagine there's a national alphabet of characters, but the different languages in, in China would use different pictures, different pronunciation. That's even more, yeah, more, more complicated if you have different pronunciation. But it's written the same. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, he's talking about this, this Bible. You've got a copy in the back, table back there. I brought one with me too, it's my favorite Bibles. Um, the question had to do with Islamic cultures and are we translating using Greek and the local language? Right, because of the, the acceptance. Because of the acceptance. I don't think it's a, as common as you might think. I know this is an example of, of a group of people that thought it would be helpful to have the Greek text. See, on this, the Greek is on one page and then the local language is on the other. They don't read Greek. It's, most people aren't educated enough to read Greek. And even if the few that are, they, this isn't the best way to get Greek. But the reason it's in here is because in, to the Islamic mind, you don't translate the God, word of God. God's word came down to, to Muhammad in Arabic. And so it stays in Arabic. No matter where, what people group it goes to, it stays in Arabic. That's why many of them don't understand Arabic. But, but, they, they, but if the Bible has the original text, it has authority. So the, the translation committee for this Dori people thought it would be helpful to make it attractive and accept it in the, in the community if it had the original text in it. That's the reason for the Greek. They don't want, necessarily want the Greek to read it. It just says, oh yeah, God's, this is God's word here in the Greek, and here's our commentary. Because you don't, you don't translate God's word, you just make comments on it. That's the way the Arabic, the, the Arab mind works. But does that answer your question about, I don't know how common it is. I don't, it's expensive to do a, a, two languages in one book. This is just the New Testament. I don't, probably the way they would break it down is, um, it would depend on how you want to, he was talking about adopting a, a group of people, a people group as a church, and how much money would you, would that cost? And I don't know that people, 
you have to break it down into projects because there's a lot of un unseen costs, like obviously supporting a translator. But I'm not, the translator's one, and then he's got a, maybe he's in a remote village and he needs a pilot to fly him in a couple times a year. I mean, there's pilot, the airplane costs, and all these costs add up to quite a bit of money. So, but the th most tangible things would be like um, helping pay for printing of the Gospel of John when that first, maybe they get their first portion translated and they're going to print 500 copies in a booklet of John. Well, the church could help fund that. Or when the New Testament comes, comes, print, comes to be printed, you could help fund the, the New Testament printing. Um, the translator needs to, I don't know, he needs a, a nice four-wheel vehicle, four-wheel drive vehicle. He's in Africa somewhere in muddy roads and you could help pitch in and buy him a, his family a vehicle. But, so projects would work well uh, for funding. Yes, sir. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, for, for the Yavo people, they still don't have electricity, but the guy was working on a computer. So they'll use generators, they'll use uh, solar panels. Um, I imagine when he fires up this satellite contraption, he has to also turn on, plug into a battery or some, some kind of a power source. Cell phones the same way. What do you do with a cell phone when it, when, when it dies? What are you going to plug it into? Well, I, again, that's, if it's important to have it, they'll probably have a, a generation generator or something in the, in the village. Um, there are a lot of people that have cell phones that don't have cell tower. Uh, they don't need a connection. So why would you want to have a cell phone? Any idea? Why would you want a cell phone if you can't, if you can't call? It's a portable media device. I mean, you, it's a portable computer. And for people that never had computers before or internet, Suddenly they can have, they can have play games, they can, well, they play games, we won't talk about that. But they can, they can have their, they can have their scriptures on here, they can have lessons from, you know, have scripture lessons, and audio versions, they can have the Jesus film on it. There's a lot of things potentially you could put on a phone. So, uh, even without electricity and cell service, it's, it, the world is, is getting a lot of phones. Any last questions? Okay. 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 Uh, the short story is I became a, I came to Christ in 1978. I was about 22 years old, and um, I didn't have a Christian background, so I didn't know what this what this all meant to be a Christian and what I was supposed to do next. But I knew it wasn't going to be a preacher, and I wasn't going to be a missionary. So. But God had other plans. Um, I got interested in missions from more, uh, I saw missions in a broader sense, and so that, that helped me to, to get a vision for what I could do. I went to a missions conference, and I heard uh, two guys who were part of the conference speak. One was a, a small engine mechanic, and one was an, an accountant. So neither one of them were, were church planners or evangelists or even translators. And so I thought there was hope for me if, like, if these two guys could be missionaries. Um, I, I gave it, my wife and I went to Mexico for two years. We tried a, a short-term test, sort of a fleece. Um, and I think God confirmed that test and we, we joined. Yeah, that was in 1987, then we joined Wycliffe in 1990. So that's, that's the short story. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us your word in our heart language in English. Help us to be advocates for, for the world, the peoples of the world that have no scriptures yet. Um, bless the translation efforts around the world and, and thank you that we have a, a, the privilege of being a part of that. Father, thank you for time together. Thank you for this day to worship, this time to worship. May you be honored and glorified as we worship you, continue to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.